and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, Movie Talk for Movie Fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is the daily show where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us today is Christian Harloff. I want to know, can you show show me? me? That's right, I'm singing that stuff. What are you singing right now? I don't know. Who knows? Welcome to Movie Talk. We're going to have a fun show today, except that guy's here, so maybe it'll be okay. (laughs) Also joining us, John Roca. (laughs) Hello, everybody. There's a lot going on. On. There's a lot going on. Very happy to be back on. Uh, thanks for having me on, and I'm looking forward to talking movies, Tarzan, and all this stuff. And rounding off our panel, John Schnepp. Metal Storm, the destruction of Jared <laughs> Sin in 3D. Yeah. All right, we got a lot of stuff to talk about. <laughs> right up top, we're not doing what you see in that sidebar. That's BS for now. Right now, we're going to talk about. Beauty and the Beast, brand new thing came out. Look at that. What a, what a crazy, Taylor crazy thing. A lot of stuff time. happened on there. You got a rose in a can. It's uh, a lot of stuff happening with a rose in a can. I look at it and I say, it looks like Beauty and the Beast to me. I like it. I get it. I just don't know how exciting it is. Schnepp, you love this thing. Why? Oh, my God. Do I love this poster. It's so many, so many different and beautiful things about this poster. It just captures Beauty and the Beast. I don't know. It's fun. Whatever. I, it's an interesting image. It's a, it's like a, it's like a teaser poster is what I could call it. You know, it's like, I don't know if it's something that you would actually buy and put in your house, but it's a, it's a great image and I'm sure they'll have those all around cinema. So you can remind you that beauty and the beast is coming and it's just showing you a little bit of like maybe the artistic style of how they're going to do it. So I like it as a teaser poster. I agree. What do you got Roka? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, if you've seen the animated film, it's very evocative of that. They, mm-hmm. You get the idea that they are going to pay a lot of homage, homage to the film and go down that vein and they understand like this was iconic already in the film so to see it come to life that's they're giving you just enough to get you excited to know that they're they're down to kind of uh bring the magic back from the animated film into live action form natasha one of your favorite animated of all time animated sure why not what do you think Beauty about this and the beast. <laughs> um, so i obviously love it but it looks it looks just like the animated feature mm. so i'm done with the teases i want to see more like this, I mean, it's cool, but it doesn't really excite me that much. Well, you mm. get excited to come Comic Con because I think that that's when they're going to show you something. I think mm. we're going to get a trailer around that time. I think Disney, everyone's always you, you talk with Disney about Marvel and Star Wars, but don't forget about how much money they made with these live, sure. the animation turned live, and they're going to do, they're going to yeah. show a little bit more. Of this is going to be one of the most profitable movies of all time. The casting is unbelievable. Yeah. This sets you up. It gets you excited for it. I agree with you, Natasha. We've got enough teases. Let's see some stuff. We'll see it at Comic Con. So let's stop talking about it. What's next? Okay. While the state of Neil Bloomcomb's planned Alien sequel is still unknown, one thing we do know is that it will not be connected to David Fincher's Alien 3 or Jean-Pierre Jeunet's Alien Resurrection. With not much to go on, we are left to wonder exactly how Bloomcomb will tackle the issue of canon in the new series. But now we have a bit more to go on thanks to franchise star Sigourney Weaver. Speaking with Entertainment Weekly, Weaver confirmed that her upcoming sequel with Bloomcomb at the helm will diverge from the pre-existing movie. The chat came on the heels of news that Aliens Reunion will be coming to Comic-Con in celebration of that film's debut 30 years ago. Here's what Weaver had to say about the new movie. It's just as if, you know, the path forks and one direction goes off to three and four and another direction goes off to Neil's movie. In discussing the idea of a new sequel to Aliens, Weaver said, I always wanted to complete this story and it wasn't really until Neil and I started talking that I said, this is why we waited however many years it's been. Although the fans want a new Alien movie with Weaver, the studio has yet to confirm a start date or release. Christian, what do you think about Bloomcom's Aliens movie diverging from canon to follow Alien and Aliens? If this indeed happens, is where someone on this panel is adamant that it will not, and we'll hear that person's view very Mm. soon. Um, If this indeed (laughs) does happen, I like this. This has been talked about for a while. I mean, even when I think Sigourney Weaver talked about this last time is pretty much what they said. It needs to do that because I think that even the people that were involved with Alien 3, Fincher did, I think he took, wanted to take his name off the movie, I mm. think. From, uh, and it, there was a lot of things that happened from the mythology from 4 and then all the other stuff that happened with Aliens vs. Predator. And it just, it just became a tangled mess. The first one, Alien and Aliens, are the ones I think fans hold near and mm-hmm. dear. It is something that uh, the way that they started Alien 3 because they couldn't sign certain people to contracts was silly. So they're killing people off in the beginning. Get rid of those versions. Nobody will care if this is absolutely what they are doing and they're following the new canon from after Aliens. Sure, you want to say that they're diverging into a separate place? No, they're not. They're retconning 3 and 4, and I'm fine with that. I'm happy with it. Schnepp, let's say that you believe this, mm-hmm. do you like if they're doing that? 
and then you can say whether or not you believe it or not. I love the idea and I love the premise of retconning and getting rid of three and four or just having it like in an alternate like dimension, just like how she's saying one forks this way and you can watch Aliens three, four, and Alien Predator and Alien AVP and all the other you know, alien films, right. and then this one forks this way, if they're able to get in line with what Ridley Scott is doing, because I really like what he's doing with Prometheus, and now the next film is now called Alien Covenant. Guess what, the ship is called the Covenant. Prometheus, that's the ship. I would love to, when all of this is said and done in like five or six years, when they release the full like unified, you know, whatever, because they're gonna, what Ridley Scott is gonna be a producer on Blomkamp's Alien, whatever it's going to be well called, it be, right? as well, right. yeah. So it's going to fit into what he's doing and how he's retconning and talking about the engineers. So I would love to see his original Alien, even though it's called Alien, be co like when it's released with all these other films, be called Alien Nostromo, mm. and Aliens is then called Alien Saluko. Wow. And then this is called, you know, Pro Alien Prometheus, Alien Covenant, and whatever this version is, which happens much later wow. in you know, basically is the sequel to Alien Saluko yeah. would be whatever the ship they're on. That's just my super nerd weirdness happening right now. But do I think this film will actually happen on before uh, Ridley Scott's Covenant and his other film? He's gonna have to make two more Alien films yeah. before they let this film go. And that's what I think Fox is just gonna be like, look, we're making Ridley Scott's <laughs> Alien movies right now. We're doing, Ali we did Prometheus. We're doing Covenant, and then we're going to do whatever that third one he's talking about that he wants to do because he was saying it's a trilogy yeah. or whatever. I mean, I don't even know if there's two more, but they're going to let him do whatever he wants, basically, with Alien yeah. before they do this one just because Blumkamp doesn't have that record now. You know, he had District 9. Everybody yeah. was – and then the second one with Matt Damon. I can't yeah. – Elysium. Like? Elysium. Yeah. yeah. I liked it, but it just had this, a little bit too much of a preachy quality to it, and they like it just didn't land as yeah. as good as we all wanted it to. And then Ralphie or whatever the other Chappie. Stubbly, Chappley, yeah. whatever the, it should have whatever been it was Ralphie. called, Ralphie. it was just a bad film. And as I could, I wanted to love it, I just could not. So, but he's an incredibly talented director. So I think his and he loves the Alien franchise. It's great to see the concept art and all the things that he like. He's a super fan, just like us. And he right. wanted, he thought when Hicks died, is like that's a betrayal of the character. When Newt died, that's a betrayal of the character. All those wounds from all those years ago are still open wounds for any fan yeah. who loved Alien and Aliens. I just watched both of those on a plane ride. It was like, what what an incredible double feature that those two films are. So my personal hopes is that they let Ridley Scott finish what he's doing. He's retconning and getting us back to the original Alien, and then this would be the perfect sequel. But you don't do you but you're I don't think it's happening. Like I said, I was me and Chris were talking a little yeah. bit earlier where I was like, look, Sigourney Weaver's an incredible actress, but she's an actress. She she's also produced on this but mm. she's not Fox she's right. not green lighting this film she's just talking about what she would love to do with this franchise mm. so I believe everything she's saying but I don't think anything is gonna happen until we get through Covenant and whatever the third Ridley Scott film is right. then they'll pull the trigger on this one okay. this is interesting I mean because it, it's almost like you're turning the alien franchise into a comic book franchise right. in that you have almost like Elseworlds type of things if you're gonna retcon three and four which three and four have its defenders a uh, three I will defend three I liked three four has its moments i thought Janae sure. did a you know city of lost children is a fantastic film yeah. and he brought that vibe to the alien franchise so it wasn't it didn't 100 percent work but there are moments and certainly extended scenes that i enjoy mm -hmm. in both those films uh and i thought there were nice concepts to take the alien franchise into but i agree with a lot of the hardcore fans should have never killed Newt off, should have never killed Hicks off. That really started the movie three off in a really bad place. You don't have to kill him off, just leave him in suspended animation. I don't understand the concept of killing him off right. other than a studio being pissed that they couldn't negotiate something, which 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 is which is heartbreaking because it's not like Michael Bean was exactly the greatest star at that time. Right. So something should have been negotiated. But for the hardcore fans, I think this is smart. It's a jumping, it's a great jumping off point. You know the first two are just universally loved for different reasons, but universally loved. So why not start there? Kind of reintroduce people. People back into the franchise, get them excited about it again, and then jump off from there. And Blancamp needs to be resurrected a bit because those last two films didn't really hit, like you said, right. John. And Christian, you were saying, is absolutely correct. Like The idea that they're doing it this way could really bring the fans back hardcore, back into the franchise. Um, and the problem is, I just wonder how much farther we're going to go with this. Mm -hmm. Because is, if are they not going to connect at any point, really, Scott and Blomkamp with they their... They will. I think, I think they, they will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, think they, that, I think that that's necessary. Yeah. Yeah, I just think for... if you're you're going to do that with set, setting up so it's not confusing. And as we get more into the lore to where eventually we tie into 
Alien, yeah. and then we know where Alien goes from Aliens, and then get into Bloom Camp's version. That is a nice way to put it all together into right. one cool package. You know, I can see the, the Blu-ray set now. Um, so I hope that's what happens, and I do hope that Bloom Camp's vision comes too, because it, like you were saying, a big District Nine fan, Elysium for me, I can take yeah. it or leave it, and I hate a Chappie, yeah. but. I want to see him do something that is not his original movie. I think mm -hmm. that it was great that he was able to do that in his career, that he was able to go three, boom, 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 his original movies, things that he wanted to do. But I want to see what he does in that studio system. I want to see what kind of director he is. I want to see him do more of that. I want to see if it may be, because he is a really, regardless of what you think mm -hmm. of Chappie, He's a great director. He is. He is a great yeah. director yeah. because he's got a great vision. He he really does. He puts together the, the shots. He puts together yeah. beautiful. The cinematography is amazing. And yeah. even he had his own. And as much as I hated Chappie, he had a vision for those characters. Right. And he, whatever, even I didn't. I happen to hate the main characters, but they were his flushed out characters. Right. They were flushed out characters. I just didn't like those right. characters. He can. I want to see what he does in this world with these characters that Ridley Scott created. So I think that he's the right man for the job, and I hope that it happens. And he also brings his own aesthetic. Like if you look yeah. at those three films, and even his short film that he did before that, it has this very specific aesthetic, and mm -hmm. he's going to bring that. Like even in some of the concept art, you see a little of his flavor yeah. meshed with the alien world. So it's like, I mean, he's working on something. Like a bunch of my friends. I mean, you know, I can't even talk about what he's working on now. Mm -hmm. But who knows what the next thing he's going to do? But it looks like his stuff. It two, always looks like his two stuff. Two questions. Well, that's a great point. Yeah, absolutely, John. Oh, two questions here. Do do we like the farther out this goes, like. You know, and this is not in any way a negative thing. Like Sigourney's getting older. Like, what are we yeah. going to do? Are they going to use that technology they use with uh, Robert Downey Jr. in Civil War? I don't think you need to. Okay. I don't think you need okay. to. I think that you can make it because, like you're saying too, maybe it's just it was just from where they go from Aliens. Yeah. It's suspended in an amount of time that she aged wherever right. wherever and, it was. And Newt. And do you and think Newt Newt, do you be... think Bean would come back? Do you think Newt? Oh, yeah. I'm not sure yeah. Bean would come back. But yeah, do you I don't think... know. Well, don't be sure that Bean okay. would come back. Because Bean, you know, from what I've heard, sometimes he, from what I heard, yeah, it'd be difficult. Um, maybe he won't be for this. Maybe oh. they'll get him back. Maybe Sigourney Weaver can get him back. But no, they're absolutely going to have an older Newt. They're not going to have a younger yeah. Newt. Right. Yeah. So it, it would work, I think. Yeah, with well, the 30th anniversary thing coming up at Comic-Con, it yeah. might be interesting to spark that. It'd be great yeah. for them to announce this at the Comic-Con. Like, look, we've got Covenant. It's almost in the bag. Mm. These are the next two films. We've like just announced the dates for it. People yeah. go, ape shit. Yeah. <laughs> <That's what we're laughs> like. so, all right, what's next? Well, we've got some more alien news to cover. This time for the hey currently now. filming Alien Covenant that we have a stellar cast in place for the Ridley Scott follow-up to Prometheus, which includes Catherine Watterson, Michael Fassbender, and Danny McBride. Most of the roles are still unknown, except now for McBride's character. During an interview with Rolling Stone, McBride confirmed himself to be the pilot of the Covenant spacecraft. He also spoke a bit about the use of practical effects in the movie with the official Twitter account releasing a new video from behind the scenes revealing what appears to be a new alien hand. During the interview with Rolling Stone, McBride said, I'm the pilot of the spaceship Covenant, which is a colonization ship, searching for a planet where we might start life anew. I run the ship. And speaking about the use of practical effects, McBride said, I didn't know if it would be all green screen, but most of the stuff is practical effects. When you're running from an alien, it's really a dude in an alien suit coming after you. The sets are incredible, and when you're in them, we go through some inclement weather at one point on the spaceship and this whole gigantic set is on a gimbal shaking up and down you don't have to use your imagination Ridley Scott returns to direct Alien Covenant which also stars Numi Rapace and Billy Crudup it's scheduled for theaters on August 4th 2017 Schnepp what do you think about Ridley Scott utilizing so much practical effects on Alien Covenant I love it I absolutely love hearing that because when you you it's like it's when you when you're acting and you're reacting yeah. to real things real elements you get the best performance I mean Obviously, they got McBride. Maybe he's going to be a kind of a Paxton-y type character. Mm. We, you know, because he's so funny, you don't want to leave that on the table. You want that on the table. You right. want him to be funny. But um, yeah, hearing that they're using practical effects and using actual real alien suits. I mean, Ridley is always building big sets, and some of the stuff we've seen just for Covenant is like mind blowing. We've seen this a couple of these giant big sets that elite have leaked online, and they look fantastic. And so, anytime I hear that they're using practical effects in the right way, where you're supposed to, CG is just a very good complement to practical effects and when they work in tandem that's when you get the best kind of effects effects that are invisible are also the kind that are really important with cg where mm -hmm.
where it's just a city street, but they actually couldn't go to New York, so they're just a person walking along. You'd never know it. So I, I like the combination of effects. Hearing that they're using a real alien, fantastic. I love it. Yeah, I'm with you. I think it's really great that they're going to practical effects, and it's something that we, we know Ridley Scott can do very well. He's done it before. He'll do it again. As far as Danny McBride goes, it, it it's it's I think I'm going to be a more serious version almost of what he was able to do in like Tropic Thunder you know mm -hmm. like that totally. that kind of tone with his with his character <laughs> and I agree that they're going to kind of do that um the the Bill Paxton type of role for him so I like what I'm hearing I want to see and it's just amazing how fickle we are when it comes to this stuff because two years ago had the Martian never come out we'd all be worried. Yeah, that's We'd right. We'd all be worried right, right now. Be like, I don't know. The last the counselor, man. Like, yeah, that's, counselor. that's what we're working about. I'm nervous oh, now. But we saw him deliver in The Martian, so everybody's okay now. And that's not yeah. just us. That's everyone now. He's he he has done. It's we are in that culture of what have you done for me lately as movie right. fans. That's what we do, right or wrong. And he right now is riding high on The Martian. And so when he's saying practical effects, that's what we're gonna do. Great, we trust you. Go. If it's after the counselor, it's like no, just don't. Whatever you say, do the opposite. Um, but I'm glad to hear this news, and I'm also glad to hear that Danny McBride will have this kind of role. What do you think? Yeah, I agree with both of you. I think it's brilliant, and it's great. And we saw in The Force Awakens that the combination of CG and practical effects really just sells the movie well, and it's what the audiences respond to. I think the verdict is in on CGI. We don't want to see full GI, full CGI films because we still want to go to films and feel like we could be in that world. Right. And I think when you see full CGI, it's really hard to gravitate to that. And so the combo of both makes you feel just, it makes you just instinctively feel like you can be part of that world. You can immerse yourself mm -hmm. in a visceral way. And I think that's important. And yeah. look, the first two films didn't need CGI and right. worked really well, were very scary, did all the jazz that they needed to, and even Prometheus, to an extent, didn't have that much CGI. It was a lot of practical effects. Right. I mean, that animal thing that with the abortion the scene was insane. Yeah. But it's so much fun to see that combined with the practical effects, and that works for me. Um, and that and that's that's what I think needs to happen with this if they're going to reestablish themselves. Because you're right, Christian. He did leave a bad taste in some a lot of people's mouths with Prometheus. Yeah. Even though I, I like again, I can defend certain scenes of it. I like Not Prometheus. Overall. Right, okay, so. fair enough. And but uh, I understand people's anger with it. You right, know, yeah. what was the white guy? What was the white man at the beginning? What does that? Oh, what does any of that mean? The guy in the white makeup right. or whatever? Like, what does that all mean? And so there, there's so you need to reestablish yourself with the strangers. And why not go this way and trust Ridley? And he's 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 let us down before, but he's also hit it out of the park before. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, what's next? The Hollywood Reporter is reporting that the nice guy standout and Gary Rice has been cast in Spider-Man Homecoming in an unknown role. Rice hasn't been working in Hollywood too long until her recent appearance in the Shane Black directed movie in which she played Ryan Gosling's on-screen daughter. She joins other Homecoming cast members including Tom Holland as Peter Parker slash Spider-Man, Marissa Tomei as Aunt May, Robert Downey Jr. reprising his Iron Man role, Michael Keaton as the villain, Disney Channel star Zendaya, Logan Marshall Green, Tony Revolori, Abraham Atta, Donald Glover and Michael Barbieri. Directed by John Watts from a screenplay by John Francis Daly and Jonathan Goldstein, Spider-Man Homecoming is scheduled to hit theaters on July 7th, 2017. Roka, what do you think about the addition of Angari Rice in Spider-Man Homecoming? Uh, real quick, it was a C-section, not an abortion. Sorry if I offended anybody. I don't want to offend anybody. It was a C-section. I don't want to get that wrong. But this, I love this. I think it's fantastic. I absolutely loved her in The Nice Guys. I went and saw that twice. She is so good in this movie. And she's Australian. And they just come out tougher from the womb in, in Australia. So, I mean, the fact that she was able to hang with Russell and to hang with Ryan Gosling and almost stole every scene that she's in because mm -hmm. she has such a maturity beyond her years on screen. Yeah. You were, I was so impressed by her. So the fact that she's going to be part of Spider-Man Homecoming is another great first step, or another great step, rather, as they go forward with this with Marvel. Spider-Man goes forward with Marvel. Marvel. Once again, the right casting, the right combination. She could be the new Gwen Stacy. I'd be totally happy with that if they're going to go that route and give her that role. Um, I, I think she's perfect. Plus her vibe in them in Nice Guys with what Holland showed in Civil War, it just works perfectly in my mind. They're mm -hmm. very composed young actors who, feel that, who can bring a gravitas and levels to their characters, which will make us interested to watch them on screen. Isn't she a little too young for Gwen, though? I, mean, she's I, I don't know how they're playing it, right. Yeah, but I don't know. I mean, yeah, again, I don't know how they're playing it. I don't know if, they, if they're going to build on it, wait years before the, the relationship blossoms. I have right. no idea. I, don't, I happen to think she's a little too young for Gwen, but 
And I think that th- that doesn't mean that, oh, well, and who's, sh- who's she going to play? She's going to play anybody re- relevant. We don't know the characters that they're going right. to introduce. Right. This. this could be somebody else that they wrote into it that they saw her in Nice Guys and said, yeah, this is perfect for her. Mm-hmm. And for people thinking, oh, it's too overcrowded now. No, it's not. It's just because people are talking about her from Nice Guys. If, if they would have announced her and she wasn't in the Nice Guys and you never never heard of her before, you'd be like, oh, it's just they, they continue to put people in there and actors. It's just that once you start hearing, oh, the girl from Nice Guys, you start to think, oh, that's more people, more actors. Mm-hmm. They're going to cast somebody tomorrow that we're never going to hear of and that's just another actor in it they have to do it they're building up this cast it's an impressive cast I agree with you Roka I think she crushed the nice guys Mm -hmm. so well she played off the amazing chemistry of Russell Crowe and Ryan Gosling so I think this is a big big positive for them to get her yeah, I mean, you know, them announcing her so late into like, I guess they've been shooting for, you know, two weeks now, three weeks yeah. now. Um, maybe they had her already set up to be announced, you know, months ago, but they just, you know, that's how they decide to drop the information. Yeah. Who is she playing? My guess would be she's playing Gwen Stacy. And my guess is she's going to be, you know, in high school with Peter Parker right. and their classmates. Because obviously what Kevin Feige wants to do is he, and he said, he wants to bring Spider-Man back into what, when he was, the, you know, obviously with Stanley and Steve Ditko, he's in high school and those are his adventures for at least the first three movies. Mm-hmm. He should be in high school. He should be a freshman, a sophomore, and then a senior. I mean, I think that would be great to see three movies done. He's all in high school. And by that time when the third movie comes out, we're talking about four years, maybe five years from now, she'll be 17, 18, whatever. So. Yeah, but here's the problem with that. Tom Holland's 20 years old. Right. So you're not going to have any romantic yeah. scenes with no. Tom Holland. She's 15. And it's yeah, just 15. Point, it's, right. It just becomes a little strange. Range. And mm-hmm. I think even if you built if you built it up like next even next year she's 16 she's 21 yeah. a 22 a 17 year old it, it just becomes a little icky as far That's as fair. I am concerned sure. but and I don't <laughs> think Tom Holland would want to get himself in that as the father of a daughter you're right. like <laughs> I'm just saying it's like you know 15 years old with a 20 year old guy I mean you know once maybe he's 25 or she's 20 it's a different story but that's not going right. to happen maybe anytime she's soon. Gwen Stacy's sister oh so who maybe. knows or, and then she introduces her to like him to Gwen Stacy at the end of the movie yeah right? that's you what should, I mean. I mean, this is another character that she Mm. can play that we don't know about yet. Someone that doesn't necessarily have to be someone from the lore. It can be someone else that they introduce inside the new movies. I'm fine with that. I think it's it's okay. I just I don't think that you automatically have to just make her Gwen Stacy because you know it's a popular character. We're gonna get her again. And she's blonde. And she's blonde. I I think they need to stay away from Gwen Stacy for now. I think we had enough Mm. of it for for I'm not saying never again, but for right now we don't need it. We just had that in the last two movies. Let's focus on other things. But the casting though. Yeah, she's yeah, a great actress. Yeah, so yeah. She could be. To see what she, does. she could be Keaton's granddaughter or something too, yeah, like totally. in the Vulture thing. Could be right. interesting. All right, Wendy, over on the Wendy cam. What have they been saying about the rose in the box? <laughs> well, for the rose in the box. While they're saying the poster is beautiful and instantly recognizable, there are a lot that are saying that it's nothing to get overly excited about. For this Sigourney Reaver uh, comment about Alien sequel. So while everyone wants to have Sigourney Reaver back, uh, it looks like a lot of people have lost their faith in Bloom Camp because mm-hmm. of Chappie. And some are saying that they'd rather see a District 9 sequel instead. Justin Vick says, I think following canon is overrelated. It matters in Star Wars or comics, but for me, it's no big deal in films like Alien. And Danny, Danny McBride's character in Alien Covenant, um, and also the use of practical effects in the movie. The chat's all in for the practical effects. Some are commenting that McBride is going to be hit or miss and that he's just going to be playing Danny McBride. Anibal Garcia says, McBride is a funny dude. Just hope they keep him in line because when he goes off, he really gets off course. And finally, for the homecoming story, the chat's loving this casting choice and they're saying maybe she will be playing Gwen Stacy, but just like Christian, uh, what you said, some are arguing that she's too young to play her. And the Powerton says, this is exciting. She was so good in The Nice Guys. She had the gravitas of Chloe Glo- Chloe Grace Moretz in Five. 500 Days of Summer or an early Dakota Fanning. I just love someone screamed at me in the chat room. It's called acting, Christian. <laughs> it's not acting when it's a 15 year old and 20, 21 year old. That's called legal problems, brother. <laughs> that's what that's called. I remember acting. Oh, we were just acting. Well, Roland Polanski. Oh, 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 it's called acting. Yes. She's pretending to be 18. Oh, acting. Jail. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Time to buy or sell. Hello. Acting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buy or sell. Natasha's going to read some more things in the world of movie news, and myself, Schnepp, and Roka, <laughs> either going to buy or sell it. What do you got first? 
Okay, Brian Cranston's involvement with the Power Rangers goes back a lot farther than his recent casting in the movie. He voiced minor villains Twinman and Snizzer during the series' run in the 90s. Now Cranston stars as Zordon in the feature film due out March 24, 2017. In a chat with the Huffington Post about his upcoming movie, The Infiltrator, Cranston spoke of the tone of the Power Rangers movie and how it made all the difference in influencing his decision to sign on. He said, At first, I was, to be honest with you, I was reticent to looking at the role because I remember the television series was kind of farcical and silly and pow and zow, weird moments and things like that. I was like, oh, okay. In discussing how he finally signed on, Cranston said, I wasn't really high on it until I talked to the producer and read the script and talked to the director. After that, I went, this is different. This is as different a reimagining as the Batman television series as it became the Batman movie series. You can't compare those two and nor can you compare this movie version of the Power Rangers to that television series. It's unrecognizable for the most part. Part. There are tenets of the folklore that you hold on to for sure, but the inspiration is different and the sensibility of it and the approach to the filmmaking is completely different. Christian Byersell, Cranston's comments comparing the new Power Rangers to the Batman movie series. I buy them. And originally, I, I you know, you hear all these reports and Schnepp and Riley kind of told me that everybody was going crazy saying that he's comparing it to the Dark Knight. That's ridiculous. He's just selling the movie. Um, no, he's not. He says he's saying if you go back, you look like the the Adam West television show and what that progressed to to Tim Burton's Batman movie and then kind of went down a different path with the Schumacher movies and then transferred into the Nolan movies and now here we are with the Snyder movies. It just had this natural kind of progression with shark repellent in the old school mm -hmm. shows. Like you can't do that in order to transfer that into a movie. So he's saying and being hesitant if they were going to do that version of what the TV was, and he saw it, said, no, it's not. It's a progression of basically what they want to do, transferring to the movies, having some of the lore in there. And very similar to what I've been talking about with like the He-Man series, or what I think that they can go from that kind of goofy silliness to turn right. it into Lord of the Rings meets Star Wars, and eventually I don't think we're going to ever see that, but I hope that we do. That's kind of the way that I took his comments, the way that he's a very intelligent dude. He is, I don't feel like he's ever really lied to the fans about anything, mm -hmm. too. He was part of the original Power Rangers, so for him to get pitched this, do it again now as not just a favor and really want to do it, I buy the comments. Yeah, okay. yeah um, I, I buy the comments. I want to admit right now, I suffer from a, a natural aloofness to the Power Rangers stuff. Like, it's never appealed to me. I've never probably seen an episode. Right. I've seen, I understand its appeal. Absolutely, I get it. But to me, that fan film that was released last year or got leaked or whatever mm -hmm. was fantastic. Right. I think I think Vanderbeek was or somebody was in that of, of yeah, some yeah. note, and it was such a good Katie fan Sackoff, film. Katie Sackoff, yeah, Katie Sackoff, right, right. It, it's all this great stuff from that fan film. So if if that's the vibe they're going with because of the positive response and Cranston is referring to that, then I'm down with it. And and I it, it, he's making logical sense. Like you're not going to make it campy. We have to make it a little more, a uh, little more deeper, stronger, kind of darker to get into the audiences now. I mean, I think Gem and the Holograms is an interesting comparison because you had this idea that this was a you know animated film. A lot of people loved it, but then when it got transferred over, they really killed all the magic of it. So if you're going to make a difference and going to make this thing like a little more dark or whatever, you got to keep the what people enjoyed about it, but then go deeper. And I think for me, I'm looking forward to it because Cranston's in it, and I want to see what they do with it. I've enjoyed the costume so far, even though some people have made fun of it. I'm like, no, this is nice. We can go with this. Right. And so I... And and you're like what you said is completely right, Christian. Guy's a smart guy. Yeah. Kranz has proved that over and over again in numerous interviews. And I think if he's saying this kind of stuff, it isn't just for the paycheck. It is because he really believes this and he wants people to give it a chance. Yeah, I think when they released those photos of the costumes, you're like, it looks like Iron Man and the Giver more so than the original kind of spandex. Right. You know, everyone's doing those crazy movements and what not, whatnot. So I think uh, you know the misinterpretation of what uh, Kranz has said. Like a lot of people are like, he's comparing. How dare he compare mm. it to the Dark Knight? He never said that he's right. basically comparing it to the batman adam west to christian bale's batman it's, mm. and it's markedly different mm. and so that when he so because he was a voice in the original yeah. power rangers he yeah. did a couple of different voices and stuff so you know and he's very wary of his career and like making the right choices for you know what he's doing now yeah. i think for him to sign on to something like this and and say what he just said like after i read the script talked to the producer and the director it has a completely different tone and yeah. he's excited to be a part of this makes me a little bit more excited about it and i'm with you i've yeah. never been a power rangers fan you know i, I watched 
watched a few clips online of them like sure. jumping around fighting rubber monsters and lasers and stuff like that. <laughs> and I, it's like, you know, it was already aged out for me. I was already yeah. an adult in college. I was me like, too. what is this stuff? So little kids who are now adults will have that nostalgia mm -hmm. for this Power Rangers thing. And Power Rangers still, you go to conventions, there's a every single version of red and pink and right. green rangers are signing and there are people walking around with little helmets. And so I think, you know, that everybody's into that version uh, who are fans here's gonna be a different version that maybe can get that nostalgia from all those people and introduce a brand new group of people oh, into it. sorry. Hey, wait uh, a second, it's the Power uh, Rangers. Terrible. Terrible. The Power Rangers. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <don't know>. anyway. <laughs> oh. That's right, Roka's got a phone. What's that, Brian? What's that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so yeah, Cranston, whatever. Let's go. I, I buy it too because I, yeah. I, I want to open my mind up to a new franchise and I think people love this so much. I'd love to be walked back in, walked into it sure. for the first time and this feels like a good way to, to walk back into it. All right, what's next? Leica Animation Studios has released the newest trailer for their stop-motion magical samurai tale, Kubo and the Two Strings. Set in a fantastical Japan, Kubo follows a young boy who possesses the power to bring origami to life with the music of his samisen on an epic journey to unlock the secrets of his legacy and reunite his family. Starring Art Parkinson as Kubo, the film also features an all-star voice cast including Charlize Theron, Ralph Fiennes, Rooney Mara, George Takai, and Matthew McConaughey. The the movie hits theaters August 19th. Schnepp, buy or sell the new trailer for Leica's Kubo and the Two Strings. Oh man, I fully buy this trailer. It's fantastic, it's magical, and also it has the, those elements that, that you can't, I mean, you can do them partially in CG, but it just feels like it's stop motion animation done really well. And if you did, if you saw Paranorman, that's a fantastic mm -hmm. film. Box Trolls was cool. I mean, it's like, but this looks like so much fun. Mm -hmm. I instantly loved the character designs. Everything about it was just magical and felt like something new. That's what, to me, sold me on the trailer. It's like, sure, it's a story that's probably been told a bunch of different ways and lots of other films that we could point to, but just the way all the characters looked and the way the shot selection, everything they did in the trailers felt like magical to me. So I, I really, I didn't even, I didn't know what to expect. I was like, oh, here's another Leica stop motion film. Here's the trailer. And then after it was over, I was like, I can't wait to see this film. So I really buy the trailer. I'll buy it as well. I think that because Paranorman, like you mentioned, I love that movie. Mm -hmm. I liked the first trailer very much. It does look magical. There are things about this movie that I think look different. And I think that what they've been doing with Box Trolls, it's just a movie that you, it's, you can feel good after you watch it because it is beautiful as well. So I'm gonna buy this trailer. It's something that I didn't really know about until the first trailer it hit, but now it's something that I'm very intrigued going into uh, after this trailer. Yeah, back back when we, in our podcast from the Top 10 show, this is one of these films that we talked about at the end of the year as something we were looking forward to mm. because we enjoyed Paranorman, we enjoyed Coraline, we don't, these kinds of out of the mainstream type animation films. And for me, it, it hits two things. One, it's a samurai uh, film. So to me, that already I'm in. And the visuals of this are so beautiful, so crisp. Mm -hmm. uh, you just get so sucked in. And the tra this, this one minute trailer was gets you back into the vibe of the film. And what I enjoyed about it is that there's a nice little playfulness mixed into everything, but not overtly so that you think it's gonna be like a jokey, let's make all the right. kids laugh mm -hmm, type right. film. It's gonna have a little depth. You have this thing with mom and dad thing and the power from the mom, but the dad's like out of somewhere he's got to save his family you got to save his people rather with his power what is he going to do with that and you have good voice talent in uh, McConaughey in, in Charlize Theron and you, you're already establishing the relationship this trailer already establishes the relationships you see the villain just quickly the fact that Ray Fiennes is going to voice him is, is mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to that and it can't be all Pixar and Disney and DreamWorks like Book right. of Life is a film that I champion Love all the Book time right because yeah. it's 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 out of the mainstream mm -hmm. and it really challenges you to explore the uh, the limits of animation and what they can do with it and how vibrant it can be and how it can introduce you to a culture that you may not have been exposed to and in and the nuances of the culture and this feels like although it's kind of out of it it feels like it's gonna go deeper into this Japanese culture, the samurai stuff. So mm -hmm. I look forward to it very much. All right, what's next? I'd buy it. The first trailer for Edge of Winter starring Suicide Squad's Joel Kinnaman and Spider-Man Homecoming's Tom Holland has been released online. Holland plays Bradley, one of two brothers, the other played by Percy Hines White, stranded on a day trip with their father, Elliot, played by Kinnaman, whom they barely know. Recently divorced from their mother and laid off, this unpredictable man
man begins terrifying the boys when they are stranded at a remote cabin. Edge of Winter is the directorial debut of Rob Connolly, who previously worked as a cinematographer. The film is co-written by Connolly and Capote producer Kyle Mann. It opens in theaters on August 12th. Roka, buy or sell the first trailer for Edge of Winter. Oh, I absolutely buy it. And I'd like to buy Rob Connolly because, brother, how did you do this? How did you get a feature film directorial debut? I've looked at your resume on IMDb. It doesn't lead to a director, so you you must have done some great talking, and you must have pitched this film really, really well. So kudos to you, because the trailer looks fantastic, and I think they cast the right person as the lead. Joel Kinnaman does such a great job of playing mm -hmm. these guys. He excels at playing these good guys who have these hidden secrets or behaviors that kind of scare you, but he's ultimately redeemable, and I think you've got that vibe from this film. This isn't like The Stepfather. This is something deeper, and I love the trailer, because you got, I love these, like, I love the winter stuff. I love the uh, God's eye view shots, and then you get this idea of their relationship and you get this danger with the with the rifle and they're out there and these two dudes that show up does he know these guys or not are they being set up in some way plus he's dealing with the fact that you know he sees the more successful stepfather that his wife is with so there's these things that he's dealing with about himself as a man uh, as a father he's, he's it sounds like he's unemployed at the beginning of the trailer so you you have these all these things going on that'll lead to a tense taut thriller and you add Tom Holland who doesn't really show up that much in the trailer so it's interesting you see more of Kinnaman than you see anybody mm. else in this trailer. So it's fascinating to me that they've done that. But I'm absolutely buying this thing. And I, I can't wait to see what they do with it. And I want to see another trailer that has a, that's a little more Tom Holland-centric mm -hmm. so that I can see what his point of view is uh, on the film. Well, I buy it. And I think that from the fact that it is a first-time director and looking, like you said, pretty mesmerizing shots just in the yeah. trailer. Mm -hmm. And then the suspense of it and Kinnaman being the main focus of the movie. The guy has been someone for me that has started off, like when I saw him in Robocop, didn't think he was that great yeah. at all. And then I saw him in, um, uh, what was the the one with Liam Neeson? That, that kind of oh, Run All Night. Run All Night. Mm -hmm. That was the one I really thought he shined in. I mm -hmm. thought he was he really good in that movie. And I agree with you. He plays these characters that are, there's something deeper inside. He definitely has a lot of demons, but there's there's more to him. And I think that that's what this movie's going to be. And more Tom Holland, I think, because once you match the two of them together in the next trailer, what what is this movie going to bring? So I'm definitely intrigued. Yeah, me too. I mean, I like I like these kind of thrillers that happen in winter. I mean, it's yeah. like they really lend themselves. This a lot of the cinematography also like evokes like Fargo or Winter's Bone or yeah. any of these kinds of a simple plan. Like a lot of films that are like small character related films. Something goes wrong. You go from one person's house or you're stuck in somebody else's house and another person shows up. It's like this. That's the kind of thriller that this feels like it's going to be. But what I think sets it apart is the cast. Yeah. And the cinematography. This guy, you know, I didn't realize he was a cinematographer, but I obviously I don't know if he's got another dude doing the cinematography. <laughs> he's ro simply rocking it himself. Yeah. But you know, it's coming from a really good compositional standpoint. I like the way that everything, all the shots that I saw, seemed to feel like very, uh, you know. Tight thriller, yeah. ev evocative. I don't know what's going to happen, and I like that they didn't show you too much. They just give you a little setup. There's a lot of family problems, and then that, then now is there going to be a murder? Are they burying bodies? What's happening? So I think as far as this a first uh, first trailer for this, I'm going to buy. It. Yeah, and Kinnaman, it's this is him going back home because if you've seen him in The Killing, which I mm -hmm. would absolutely recommend to people, it's on Netflix. Watch him in the four seasons of The Killing. This is this is so in his wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. This is what he does best. And Christian, you're right to bring up these movies but if you've seen him on tv you know he's possible to i mean it's possible for him to give a fantastic performance well you know why that is wanted it. yeah it's called acting <laughs> <laughs> all right what's next oh wait that's it that's what, it. now we're gonna go yeah. to the wendy cam wendy what have they been saying about buy or sell well they're talking about power rangers and they're buying brian cranston's comment it looks like a lot are saying that a more serious tone is getting a few more people interested in this movie patrick hughes says I do want Power Rangers movie to diverse itself from that television series, but I do hope that it does lose the fun that is that it doesn't lose the fun that is Power mm. Rangers. There is a level of campiness that should be present. And for the Kubo and the Two Strings new trailer, while a lot of the chat are buying this, myself included, some are selling just because they're not into the stop motion style of animation. Mm. James Clark says, I actually like the previous trailers, but for some reason, this one just didn't work for me. I'm not sure what it was, still excited though. And finally, for the first trailer of Edge of Winter, it doesn't look like a lot of people saw the trailer or heard of the movie, but they do like the cast. All right. Thank you, Wendy. And now it's time to move into opening this week, brought to you by our friends over at AMC, the latest and greatest in the movies. What do we got? What's coming out? 
All right, we got Mike and Dave need wedding dates. Mike and Dave, played by Zac Efron and Adam Devine, are young, adventurous, fun-loving brothers who tend to get out of control at family gatherings. When their sister Jeannie reveals her Hawaiian wedding plans, the rest of the Strangles insist that the brothers bring respectable dates. After <laughs> placing an ad on Craigslist, the siblings decide to pick Tatiana and Alice, played by Anna Kendrick and Aubrey Plaza, two charming and seemingly normal women. Once they arrive on the island, however, Mike and Dave realize that their companions are ready to get wild and parte. Fathers and Daughters, a Pulitzer Prize winning author played by Russell Crowe, checks into a mental health facility after the death of his wife, while his daughter, played by Amanda Seyfried, calls for, or falls for an aspiring novelist, played by Aaron Paul, years later. Fathers and Daughters sounds interesting. I, I really have to go and check out the trailers for that one. I like all the actors involved mm -hmm. in that particular one. I want nothing to do with Mike and Dave. I want, I want, I want nothing to do. Why not? It sounds great. Uh, what are you talking about? It sounds like a fun comedy it, rom. From what I heard originally, and it's not... A month ago, I would have been on board more because I do right. think Zac Efron is very talented. I think that uh, Divine is, is very talented. I think all the girls yeah. involved mm -hmm. are very talented, but from what I've heard about this movie, people that I trust that have seen it said it was just abysmal. A giant pile of steaming uh, garbage. garbage. <laughs> I mean, from, from it just, and you can see where it could have went down two different paths. One, the unexpected hysterical path. Right. And for everything I'm hearing, it went down the path of darkness. But the trailer alone is like LCD. I know. I mean, it's the it's, lowest it's, common it's, denominator. It really, really it's is. Really, like, really a racist joke at the end of your trailer. Yeah. When I saw it, I was like, Wow, this, I mean, I don't even want to see this movie because of the sense of humor. So I was like hoping that, oh, maybe reviews will come out. And, you know, because I was going to, I was like, I'm going to wait till let all my other friends suffer yeah. through it and then I'll find out whether it's good or not. And I guess the verdict is in and everybody hates it. So I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, Fathers and Daughters sounds really interesting. It looks like a really cool kind of terse drama. So I, I, yeah. that's one I'd go see. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like Mike and Dave, that's just, I don't, what is Anna Kendrick doing in a movie like this? She, she is so past the movie like this. She has I no know, business being in a movie. Like, she should not she's a, this is a woman that should be winning an Oscar at some point. And soon. Efron's a what good actor, yeah, too. Yeah, he yeah, should Efron. stop doing these goofball films, yeah. too. You and know, Aubrey like, Plaza, too. Like, Aubrey Plaza's fantastic in Parks and Rec. It, what, what was the movie they was did it together? All that just everybody recently? was like, let's get a paycheck. What I was think, the one you know? they did just she recently? The, Aubrey Plaza? She yeah, with Grandpa. Yeah, yeah, Dirty Yeah, it was with Zach. Yeah, and Robert De Niro, which was a waste. And it's these things like Aubrey doesn't need to be doing this stuff. So it's just surprising to me. And I like the guy from Workaholics. He was great on Modern Family. He's had a great arc on Modern Family. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's a very funny mm. guy. It I just, wonder if they end up as couples at the end of the yeah, movie. Right, right. Mm. I'll, yeah, right. I'll tell you what, though. It just hit all the wrong notes for me uh, for a comedy. Because Neighbors, Neighbors was great. Yeah. This was fun. This doesn't feel like fun at all. Zach Efron's agent hates him. <laughs> he puts him in all these things. That, that was that weird on? disco one. What are we people? We're, or, yeah. we're all oh, weird. Yeah. We're yeah. friends. This movie, we're the grammar friends. Like he got neighbors and neighbors too, and that one's like it keeps him up there. But the yeah. guy is talented. He yeah, can act, right. and he and he's good. In, me and Orson Welles, you're seeing him in that. Yeah, yeah, he was really good in that. Paperboy, yeah. he's awesome he in that. He is. <laughs> no, but he is. Good I thought he was great. Really? Like really? Paperboy? Yeah. I did not like Paperboy at all as a film, but but he did a nice job. Yeah, yeah. So I just think that he should be doing more stuff, and this is just hurting his career. But I don't. I, well, who knows? I didn't yeah. see the movie. I don't want to see it. Let's I just <laughs> smash it. Box office bonanza. <laughs> 200 million. Right. Of the, what, what's happening? Yeah, I feel like, <laughs> we I don't know. understand. Maybe yeah. if it had a Transformer. Can I, Fathers yeah. and Daughters, though, looks to me looks very, very good. And I'm, I love these kinds of movies where Russell has challenges to, like, becomes a vulnerable guy, a mm -hmm. real guy, human guy. Like, I love that. Instead of a superhero or a right. hero type guy, it's always great to see him. Like, a nice guy. He has his flaws. He plays that stuff really well. I saw, oh, you mean act? Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. I saw Beautiful Mind again the other day, which I hadn't seen in a couple of years. And I absolutely loved him in that. And I was yeah. like, these are the kinds of things that he's so good at and why we still love him mm -hmm. as an actor, even though he's throwing phones at people sometimes. Like he's got this thing that's so magical. And Amanda Seafried has been slowly building herself sure. up. And Aaron Paul, it's always nice to see Aaron Paul take that Breaking Bad cachet and go and push his limits further in these feature films. And to me, if you've if you've dated, you understand if you've dated a woman. Women and women and their fathers. That's a whole separate relationship. It's very complex, and I like that this film is exploring that and seeing the nuances that it's involved in that relationship and what it's like to date someone who's had like had issues with their father and all this. So it's it's. I think this is great, and it looks so interesting. Uh, that I'm looking forward to it Definitely. very much. All right, thank you once again for our friends over at AMC Theater and opening this week. Uh, great, great comment here. Someone says that uh, Efron's agent is Snoke. 
That's great. Um, <laughs> that's a really good comment. I love that comment. Okay, Are you sure it's not Plagueis? Yeah. Now we're gonna we're gonna move on here to mailbag. Remember, guys, to we're gonna take a few Twitter questions before the show ends. So make sure that you get those tweets in at Collider Video. Natasha will be going through those, and you see the big shiny belt there on Friday. It goes down. That's tomorrow. We are less. We're just about twenty four hours away of getting Riley versus Merle. It is the big championship match. I am really excited about this one. I've talked about it pretty much in depth. Uh, Roca, yeah. you have watched both of these guys. Man. Who do you got going into this thing? I got to go with my boy Riley. As much as I uh, have respected and love Morell, and he's a fellow Seminole, like, uh, he's smart as hell about film. But Riley's been the champion for so long. Riley's collider and Schmoe's nose boy. So I got to go with my man. And we did a podcast. We, for a little while, we did a podcast together. So I have a very special affinity for Riley. And, I, and my man knows movies. My man knows movies. So I really believe in him and want to see him uh, win this thing and, and retain the title. So that's my feeling. Let's get that wide shot there. Look at that. Look, look, at, mm. look at that. Look at that shot. That is an epic shot right there. Yeah. I'm very excited for that one. Schnapp, real quick, you, you didn't come up with a winner yesterday. Right. Who, do you think, who do you got? Man, I, I still – it's too tight. It's, it's going to be really tight. I mean, it's like they're both really good with trivia and knowledge and, like, knowing little, like, details and things like yeah. that. I mean, I was just on movie fights, like, a month and a half ago and, like, got into it with Merle, and I was wrong. I was arguing, like, you're wrong about this. And I was like, you know, whatever. It was AI or some one of the, mm. the Spielberg films, and he was right about some specific thing. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, so it's going to – I think it's going to be a really tight race. Yeah. So. All right, now it's time for Mailbag. Let's get into it. What have you guys been asking? Natasha, what have they been asking? Well, Levi White writes, Hey guys, so I recently saw The Legend of Tarzan at an AMC Prime Theater. The theater was awesome. The movie, not so much. I noticed that Tarzan was absolutely void of charm and that Samuel L. Jackson was only in the story to add some comedic relief and expository dialogue as Tarzan's trusty sidekick. My question is, who are some of the best sidekicks in film? Thank you, shit rats, for life. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> I love, first of all, thank you for the nice uh, shout right. out to the rats. But I, I will. I actually kind of disagree with you. I think that Tarzan himself in the movie. Oh, well, I agree that the movie wasn't that great. I will tell you. I thought Tarzan was actually pretty good. I thought Sam Jackson was totally misplaced in that particular film. But uh, the question of sidekicks go. I think Robin's a little too easy to talk about, even though I don't think he's really been portrayed well in right. film yet. No, um, yet. Oh, give, he's dead. You don't I, even get. To we don't him. even know. I'll, I'll give you Silent Bob. <laughs> Right, hey, Silent Bob's a great that. sidekick. Oh, great! That's Silent great. Silent Bob's been in a few different movies, and mm -hmm. and he's been he's been very loyal. He's been handy. I go. I'm going with Silent Bob. What do you got, Snoop? We go a short round. Oh, it's a good one. What? Indiana Jones. Oh, you good, hate Temple good Doom. Pal. I do hate I Temple, Temple of Doom. Doom. I love hey, it. Look, you know, so it's like, good prequel. I might not so, think so, it's the greatest film, but I like short rounds. So you got a problem with the racist joke at the end of Dan, but you don't got a problem with the racist portrayal. Short, of short rounds, rounds, perfect, man. He's like, <laughs> I, I don't know why perfect. you got to be hating yeah. on short Damn rounds. Damage step. What do you also hate the Goonies? What's wrong with you? Oh, hey, you don't anyway, like the Goonies. I, I really don't look, like No one likes you. Rogue is challenging me. Let me just say an easy one, Bucky. You know, he's a winner. Oh, yeah. oh Bucky's you know, great. You know, he's a sidekick, yeah. though? He was a sidekick. Yes. He, was, he was always yeah. a sidekick. Yeah. Yeah, he yeah. was like, literally, he was the Robin to Captain America. If yeah. He was Batman. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they aged him up, and they made him, like, a lot older now. So he's kind of like his his peer. Yeah. And with yeah. Winter Soldier, he's definitely, like, their pals. Yeah. But uh, I would, I would, I'll change it from short round to Bucky. Because yeah, of Roca. I thought you were going to go with uh, uh, Nice. I thought you were going to go with Chewbacca. Oh, Chewbacca's well, awesome, but hey, I'll take you that. Just you just took my. I just stole yours. I, yeah. have I have Chewbacca, Donkey, and Shrek. Oh, good oh, nice. Donkey! Right. <laughs> you know, people like, people like Parfait. Uh, Watson in the new Sherlock Holmes movies. Mm. Uh, uh, he does a great job. Dory in Finding Nemo. Goose in Top Gun. And finally, Wilson in Castaway. That's oh, one yeah, of the most amazing sidekicks yeah. ever. Yeah. Very silent. Never says a word. Silent, yeah. but, he is, but he drives that movie. Yeah. If you want to see Roca hate on the Goonies some more, make sure you watch his brand new show, the Top Ten Show. It's on every Wednesday. Brand new episode dropped yesterday, and he, him and Matt Nost they really break down something that's happening in the world. The current movies coming up, but they relate the list to it. Yeah. But yesterday, you guys did talking. Animals. Yeah, we did top ten talking animals on film because of the Secret Life of Pets right, coming right, out, and right. uh, it, it was fun to explore this. When we first started, when I first started to look at this list. I didn't think I would get, and I realized, man, 30, at least 30 that really? you could make an argument for, make a case for. And I always run my lists by a couple of film friends, and they always come up with stuff. So we probably left a couple good ones off, but uh, it's been so much fun to do this, to be on camera doing
doing this with Matt and like just seeing what we can do. And it was a it's a blast of an episode. Can I so. ask, did you have Mr. Ed on your talking? Uh, about? It's on film. Just film. Mr. Ed's not on film. I thought they made a Mr. Ed movie. Uh, th maybe. Did they? No. They did. No. It wasn't good though. So it was no. so awesome that I never saw it. <laughs> yeah. I think you're thinking of uh, Hot to Trot. But it was a talking horse. I yeah, know that. I will say that I left one off, but I maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe I should let people yeah, watch, watch it. And let, let them, them, top let them yeah. kill yeah. me for it. Well, that's the whole point. Is you, it's so much fun to yell yeah. Roca in the comment section. So go on over there and do that. All right. <laughs> what's true. what's next? True. Okay, Ryan Santana writes, Hi, Collider Gang. I love the show and have been watching since the AMC days. My question deals with increasing budgets for films. I was on Box Office Mojo, and I was stunned when I saw that The Legend of Tarzan had a production budget of $180 million. I understand the concept of spending money to make money, but do you think Hollywood is getting pretty ridiculous and carefree with its budgets? I mean, Blumhouse seems to have the simpu simplest, simplest formula. <laughs> for example, it makes movies for $5 million and break even opening night night so why do we keep seeing these inflated budgets for subpar ideas like tarzan you would think that a studio could differentiate between a financially brilliant idea and tarzan but the numbers don't seem to coincide with common sense so please explain this to me thanks and keep up the great work uh well, let's have to take this one to i start. got you tarzan right here hey, oh, hey let me get it right go 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 again. we're gonna throw a gopro <laughs> get a muscular dude with a good <laughs> six pack have him jumping around we'll add some cg apes for like six bucks hey, i yeah, like that but get so the easy. door from wolf of right, wall street put it in there put it in there like right? remember she was in tarzan yeah there's a tarzan with bo Derek. you got gray stroke and all these other days i like it i like it i put a little bit of this a little bit of that a little bit of pepper over here it's great it's great not gray stroke let's make that Stroke do. that thing. Yeah, so Margot listen, Robbie. movies cost a ton of money. Like it's always, it's people are always like, well, why did they spend 180 million dollars <laughs> just to do PNA print advertising? That's like 30 to 50 to sometimes 100 that's million. That's not even included. No, in I know way. it's not yeah. even included. But yeah. I'm just trying to like lay it out. Like, look, you get a something on a bus, you get something on a bus stop, you got, you know, like we live here in Hollywood. It's like you see everywhere. There's like the cars are wrapped. I mean, all that stuff costs so much money. Yeah. Um, the, actually, the movie itself, you have to pay the stars. Like, we don't know how much any of the people, just say from Tarzan, you're talking about maybe fees that upwards to about maybe 15 million. Mm -hmm. So 15 to 20 million, let's just to say that. And then you have, you're building your sets, your production budget, you're shipping things out to wherever they're filming it. Say that's another like 30 to $40 million. It's just every week when you have a crew on, every day of 60 people, yeah. and each of those people are make 500 to 1,000, $1,500 a day, especially union, let's just yeah. add even more to that. When you go past 12 hour, you're in golden hour, you're in super time, overtime, double time, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars every day of the shoot maybe right. three four hundred thousand dollars spent every day that they're shooting and these shoots are like 30 to 40 to 60 days that's where you get your money spent so i mean i think something like tarzan like look yeah i mean bloomhouse can make a tarzan movie and they could probably spend five million bucks but would it get that kind of press that this film is getting now this film's released internationally it made 44 million or something like mm -hmm. that here in the u.s it's probably going to make a, like at least that internationally so is it going to make its budget back in two three weeks maybe but in order for a film to get in the black it has to double up it has to double and plus its budget mm. just to get in to like hey now we're actually making two dollars so i mean yeah is it un is it crazy to hear that a tarzan movie costs 180 million dollars yes it is i mean to me i'd be like hey if they spent 60 million on this tarzan movie that in, at least in my mind seems to make more sense than 180 million but i haven't seen the movie yet there's a billion cg apes jumping around you saw it, right? Yeah. There's a lot of there's probably a lot of big expensive shots, yeah. but yeah, Tarzan. I don't know. Hey, you say good things, right? <laughs> um, all right, now it's time for one Twitter question. We kind of run out of time here, so Natasha's been going through some. Pick out one that you like, and I'm sure it's going to be from Bazinga guy. <laughs> <laughs> he does have some of those good questions. <laughs> Um, okay, wow. Let me find one. Metal That's not Bazinga. That's guy. not Bazinga. Sorry, like, Bazinga guy asks good questions, but <laughs> I realize guy. I have to give like everyone else yeah. a chance. I know. Okay, so Sean Blanford asks, what movie uh, that ha may not have been f a financial success would you say is a must see? Uh, Destruction of Jared Sin, Metal Storm. There it is. Wait, Me one and Roke one were that was about not earlier. financially. Yeah, one that wasn't financially successful. The Nice that's Guys. A must see. The Nice yeah. Guys, man. It came out this year. It's one of my favorite movies this year. Absolutely. It's, it's the one that kind of angers me because you always get questions like, how come people don't make original movies? They are, but the thing is, you're not going to see them. Mm -hmm. This is a movie everyone should have seen. That movie should have done at least 60 to 70 opening weekend it yeah. would never happen with a movie like that the marketing alone um but that's a movie i think was criminally underseen 
Mm -hmm. Go down that path. Yeah, nice guys. Kiss, kiss, bang, bang. Should have yeah. made a crap yep. ton of money. Sure. Out of sight should have made a crap ton of money. Out of sight is fantastic. I champion that film all the time as a film that should have hit and never did. Scott Pilgrim versus the world. There is no reason that shouldn't have broke 200 million. Right. Like that film is so well done, so fantastic. And it, it hits the video game button correctly for people that love video games. So I didn't, and it's a great story and great acting by everybody involved. I but like <laughs> it, 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 so to me I was so shocked that that film didn't blow up yeah I think Moon Moon oh, yeah. should have made oh, more Moon. money yeah. and that's one of those films where it's literally like it's a Bloomhouse style film it didn't cost that much money it was like basically one or two actors in it at most yeah. and uh, you know I think it critically everybody loved it and it just what didn't people didn't go to see it now they discover it later on, on you know but that's how a lot of films Dread is one I want yeah. to definitely yeah. mention oh, Dread. and I saw yeah. Dread the very last day it was in the theater in 3D and it's some of the best use of 3D. I, I would like put it up there with art. It was like fi I was watching fine art in violence. So it's like some of the most amazing, beautiful violence I've ever seen in a film. And it was a great, yeah, everyone's like, it's just like the raid. Look, they were making the movies at the same time and then they both came out. It's not like they were like trying to, e either one was copying each other. Mm -hmm. It's a great film. I look forward to them still using Carl Urban in whatever the next Dread movie they or Dread, Dread TV series they're able to do. Check out Dread if you never saw it. It's mm -hmm. a lot of fun. Um, another one, by the way, a lot of people didn't realize didn't do well financially at all was Shawshank Redemption. Yeah, really? Did, Good oh, point. It did terrible. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it was out of the theaters yep. very fast, and now it's one of the most Revered. beloved movies yeah. of all yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys, that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to thank everybody that was involved today in making this show what it was, the crazy circuits it became. Mm -hmm. uh, Wendy Lee Zaney, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. Hey, my good buddy there, uh, Petey Peppers, where can they find you? Yo, you can find me just over, you know, on Twitters and Instagrams. Go over to at John Schnepp. Check out my movie, The Death of Superman Lives. What happened? Hey, what happened? I don't know, but go to tdoslwh.com and find out what happened. Maybe order a couple of things. And also check out Heroes. Collider Heroes was on yesterday. Then watch it. Yo, hey, what about your show? What, hey? You know what? I like the things that you do. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Moving on to John Roca. John, where can yeah. they find you? I'm going to get the papers. The papers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, you guys you can always find me at the Roca says on uh, Twitter and on Instagram. Um, please watch uh, the Top Ten Show here every Wednesday, 2 p.m. Drop, subscribe to the channel, watch us talk about stuff. Matt Nost and I just—it's a, it's a really fun time. We're not a—it's not Siskel and Ebert. It's a couple of dudes who love films, talking about films, hanging out with you for an hour. It's really great stuff. Please uh, watch it or please subscribe and listen my, to my new podcast called The Cinephiles. It's on iTunes, where me and a film professor friend of mine, Steve Morris, here in Los Angeles, break down one. One film, classic film, before the year 2000. Talk about its production history, the casting, and what its legacy is to the history of film. And last thing, apparently, parts one and two of the Game of Thrones season review, season six review, dropped this morning. Me, Dennis, uh, Avital Ash, Perry Nemiroff, Jonathan Voidko, we break down the very dense and complex 10 episodes of season six of Game of hey, Thrones. Hey, can I ask you this? Like, yeah. episode, like they put Game of Thrones last year, like oh, two years ago, the season yeah. four, like, I think it was season four in the movie theaters, like episodes nine and 10. Right. And then they didn't do it with season five. And then this season was they, so epic. They really should. Episodes nine and 10, Please put them back out yeah. in IMAX. Like you're, it's just you're leaving money on the table. Yeah. I think it'd be fantastic. And we said we said that in the review. Nine yeah. and ten should be. A, oh, you could release it. Should be. A, I just a want to see film. that in a giant yeah. IMAX. Yeah. All right. So go and check that out. That is going to be up. And Natasha Martinez, where can they find you? You guys can find me on Twitter and the gram at Natasha Lexis underscore. And for me, you can find me Christian Harloff, Twitter and Instagram. Remember tomorrow, big championship match. Hence the belt. Dan Merle trying to capture the title from the reigning champ, Mark Riley. It happens tomorrow. Check out Collider Jedi Council. Make sure that you share this video. Let people know about it. Post it on Twitter. Post it on Facebook. And comment and like. Do all that stuff. If you're a fan of movie talk and what we're doing, it really helps us out. Thank you guys so much, and we'll see you tomorrow. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.